Do you want to go ahead, Adam? Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you very much for giving up your evening and uh, yeah, coming along to this Q&A session. Um, so I'm a senior lecturer for Moxa Brooks um, and I've been conducting some of the research. Um, one of the main projects that we've been looking at um, is looking to show kind of prevalence figures um, within elite sport. Uh, we've predominantly done that within football at the moment, obviously looking to do that across different sports and not just elite level, but also lower down as well. Um, and what we've actually found in the 118 that we've screened so far um, is that we found seven colourblind players. OK, so we know that they are there at the highest level. Um, but if you're looking at that as, as a percentage, that's only six percent, whereas the actual kind of national average is eight um, percent. So it's suggesting that some players maybe aren't making it to the highest level, um, potentially due to the challenges that they face around colour vision deficiency. Um, so off the back of that, obviously happy to take questions in terms of how can we support those players? Um, what are some of the challenges that they face? Um, so yeah, I'll hand it back over, but happy to obviously ask, uh, answer any questions directly related to that, um, or obviously anything around kind of supporting individuals players experiences as well. We've got a former elite player um, at the end. Hi right, Catherine. <laughs> Hello. 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 Yeah, Andy. yeah, thank you. Yeah, obviously, obviously really interesting research. I think probably the the biggest standout for me was, you, you know, like you just said there Adam, around the fact that players aren't making it to the elite level, which is is the concerning thing um, as a colour blind former football also gives me a good excuse as to as to why I didn't make it. Um, but it's I think that for me now is in my role as a, as a coach developer. That's the um and I, I've already discussed, you know, that research since it was released this morning with um with internally with the FA around that and how we can I suppose it's not really a question. It's 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 just, you know, it's got me thinking about what what's the what is the biggest thing we can do to make sure that those players are getting the best opportunity. And obviously Catherine, we've worked together in terms of putting you know resources and, and and things in place it's just you know now we've got that that really fantastic and evidence it's what's the, what's the next step isn't it in terms of providing that so i know it's quite a broad question but just you know obviously digesting the the, the research this afternoon having seen it for the first time it's i think that's the big question for me going forward yeah, well, we were just talking after the panel session and one of the things we'd like to discuss maybe as the next step is where the resistance is coming from the change at elite level. I mean, James, you raised that particularly. Um, and um, yeah, basically, what do we think the resistance is being caused by? Uh, I think from my my view is what I've come across so far is um, a lot of people like to hide behind the fact that, um, well, you know, we didn't have to do anything before and is it really as bad as you're making out and do we really need to do anything? Why should we? Um, and it's breaking through these preconceptions of there's no need for change, which is the hardest thing, I think, from from my side. Um, yeah. James, I think what you wanted to say specifically. Yeah, so I wear two hats, obviously. Um, I'm head of wellbeing and development at Swansea City Football Club. So there's very much the, the organisational hat there. And then Beyond the White Line, which is a not-for-profit that I founded sort of in 2018, uh, comes at it through a slightly different lens. So if I may, I'll, I'll go with that hat on uh, and sort of cover the badge for a second. My experience to date until working with Swansea was just pure resistance across a lot of these areas. So whether it be colour blindness, whether it be neurodiversity, whether it be mental health, any anything really away from the pitch to do with the human being, it was always met by stakeholder resistance and, and at the most senior level at times. And, and um, I think for me, that's been the biggest breakthrough with Swansea. I mean, it really was, you know, a, a blank page where there was no resistance at all. It was welcomed, if anything. And that's enabled us to change the environment, to change the culture, to change the attitude towards these things. And, and obviously with the data and with the study and it's, you know, then it's been backed up uh, going back into my Swansea hat, it's been backed up then when we've done the screening and established that there are players within our first team squad and our academy all the way through. Um, it was really, a, 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 for me, a simple shift. It was, um, and I said it in the panel this evening, and I, I think Nick definitely as a former player and yourself could have benefited from this, but it really doesn't matter 
um, whether you are colorblind, whether you're not. I mean, yes, we need to raise awareness and educate, but it should fundamentally be create the environment, educate coaches so that it doesn't matter. So if you come into that system, it's already system is already built to accommodate you in the best possible way yeah, and therefore absolutely. you can thrive you can go through it and have the same experience you can reach your optimum levels and then if you go on to do something else and, and leave football it doesn't matter your experience within it was a positive one so that for me that should be standard and that resistance just to finish on that sorry the resistance is what i really want to change and use ones is this case study to to drive that systemic change and i think that's what's got to happen for us to make any grounds and I know that you said that it would have made all the difference for you you know your experience uh, coming through sorry I'll turn this so you can see it yeah following <clears throat> following on um, from a player's perspective what you're looking at is an equation of of what your value is and how much you can make an issue out of something which other people might not find an issue so you're there to train, you're there to play to your best potential, and there's a barrier to your to your playing. You actually can't differentiate between the two teams or different colours. To tell a coach that at a younger age, the coach is looking at what's your value to me? Um, is there another player that we don't have to be concerned about with this issue? So no, you're not going to tell the coach because it puts you at uh, a negative straight away um, within a competitive environment. You don't want to isolate anything that's going to make you less than other people. So it's not just the ridicule that you might get. It's also you're going to put yourself at disadvantage. <laughs> to say that to a to a adult, to say that to a, a grown coach when you're 10, 11, 12, that you've got an issue and can you please change the training session? It's a very daunting thing for a child to do. I only spoke up when I was in the professional ranks and I felt like I had the power to to at least tell people that I had an issue and being in the first team it was really tangible that if you can't get the best out of me then you're, you're wasting a player basically and the only difference that I would have said needed to be changed was some consideration literally just don't pick bibs that flash it's, it's quite from 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 a colorblind person's perspective, it's quite an easy change, but if you're not considering it, you just don't think about it. And that can be the difference between the levels. It can be the difference between the numbers that you're seeing where kids who don't speak up, are just gonna leave. They're not gonna play very well. So you're gonna think that there's some sort of issues which you don't know about. Mm. Um, and the adults that get into the elite level, they've probably got some sort of coping strategies so that they can hide. Um, so it's not that it's not an issue for them. They're just hiding and they're doing it very well. Um, so I think that's, from my perspective, what I found from a player on the player side. Meantime, champions on and off the pitch will help push the... The diamonds. ...and removing jobs to this. Yeah, that's true. The whole point of the player is you know, can come out of your partners, help drive this from another perspective. Oh, we would love the revenue, yeah. yeah. It's not visible, yeah. Yeah, that you're alienating part of the... Um, the audience, so does that mean you're you're forcing people to switch off and they may not otherwise, so you're not maximizing uh, the viewership. Yeah, and it's yeah. not just that, there's a backlash against the sponsors of organized, um, yeah, I'm not gonna name them, but you know, the sponsors of certain competitions are now starting to get backlash from fans, you know, moving on from, not moving on from the players, um, but just talking about fans for a while. Um, sponsors are not going to like getting backlash in social media if they're taking the hit. Um, so maybe they could maybe they could help us push the dial as well. Um, I know that fans are getting more and more keen to directly approach the sponsors if they don't like what happens on the pitch because they can't tell the kits apart or whatever. Please will come back. I think um, we, we mentioned there in terms of um, people switching off especially watching um, you know, games on the TV and things like that. Um, the other way that you could look at it is, you know, there are traditions. So, for example, one of the kit clashes is red, red and green. So Wales versus Ireland. Um, there's guidelines from World Rugby in terms of avoiding those kit clashes. Um, but are the sponsors reluctant to change 
uh, certain kit clashes because that's who they want to see their fans wearing those certain kits. Do they want to sell more more kits to those individuals? Yes, there's third kits within football as well, um, which even if those two colours um, of the home and away kit aren't necessarily good enough in terms of that kit clash, is there a third kit that individuals can bring in? Um, so, so we know that there are some guidelines, especially for the English Football League as well. Um, the guidelines is a great start. Um, obviously, we need to make sure it's actually implemented and people are taking this on board. That's really the next step. Then One of the things that I always find quite surprising is that clubs can spend millions and millions on a player. Um, and the most fundamental thing is that they can um, perform very quickly in very uh, pressurised circumstances and yet um, not only do they not check about colour blindness when colour is a fundamental element of the game um, but they don't then um, want to recognise that this is an issue so they can make the most of the assets if you look at people purely as financial assets of the assets they've already paid for yeah. uh, that makes no sense to me at all um, we do know of one player that moved from a, a club where he played in a in a kit that was not going to be a kit clash issue or have any any issues uh, to a club where potentially as a colourblind person he would have issues and it's well documented that this player his performance was um, significantly worse than the club who'd bought him was expecting um, and to me it's blatantly obvious why that was um, because the new team that he moved to um, played in a kit that he was going to be struggling to distinguish from the grass and they paid millions and millions for him. Nobody even thought about it. And still they're resisting thinking about it for all the players that they bought that are in that position. Quite a bizarre. I think Ryan's got a question. Go on, Ryan. Yeah, just, just, just link to that, Catherine. I think that, you know, flipping the research on its head, that, that is something that, you know, people have got to take notice of now, isn't it? In terms of the fact that, you know, every every squad that you've screened has got a cold blind player. So, you know, if that's if that's across the board then like you say you know they've got this asset already already in place so it's a case of you know getting the most out of it isn't it and hopefully that that element of the research will make people stand up and and look at what they can do to to make sure it's the best environment for every player on, on that ryan though it was what's interesting as well is that because got this kind of touched on a previous point about players not wanting to maybe raise it like nick referenced and stuff but also you know whether it's a club level or international level there's a lot of players who you know are really struggling and and they're they're, they're keeping it sort of sort of private and they're not willing to disclose it for all the reasons we cited in the main panel this evening and again now and i think but we shouldn't we even have that. to rely on them to ha to sort of yeah. come out and say look this is a challenge for me if we've created this positive environment and this this <laughs> environment that you know really allows them to thrive and i think you know the responsibility does fundamentally come back to the clubs, the associations, the, you know, the sponsors, all the key stakeholders in the industry. And and I don't want to hijack this point with other issues, but I mentioned mental health and, and neurodiversity and other things, and the list goes on. I mean, it's not when it, when you really get down to brass tacks, it's not a big ask, as we said, whether it's balls, bibs and cones, things like that, pl better planning, better education, with the amount of money in the game, it, it this is so insignificant on that landscape. That is really no barrier for this change. Um, yeah. So that's just bizarre. <laughs> you know. Last thing you said. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, <laughs> quite good. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, I should say that I'm completely blind, not just colour blind. But anyway, um, no. The point that you were making there is, I'm, I, and this is not. It might turn into a question, but you know. I'm not sure what the costs are in terms of like bibs, cones and, and balls. I'm sure there's more to it. But if you look at how much money clubs spend on their academies and how much they invest in that, and if you point out to them that like the difference between that 6% and the 8% means that, the, that they are they are wasting, literally wasting their own money. Yeah. It, it And also, like we're a club, respectfully, you know, we're a club that, do have a track record of producing academy players and that go on to be traded on and sold or, or absolutely or, 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 but, but also one if, player if, if you if you were a player who was colorblind who was 14 yeah who wasn't getting anywhere yeah and 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 and, and they get to hear about swansea that that 
without them having to identify that's the reason they're going to the Swansea Academy or they're interested, all of a sudden they turn up at Swansea and they're a better player, as if by magic. And, I mean, and if, <laughs> and if they thrive, wrong. if they thrive, it pays for itself almost indefinitely. Yeah. One player, like, I mean, it's you can't even do the numbers, I'm not even going to try, but one player trading out of the academy and being sold even modestly for a modest fee, it pays for itself essentially indefinitely. Yeah. Um, I just wonder whether you know the sort of turning it around and getting the attention of 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 uh, whatever degree of coaching management that actually you you turn it into a financial issue. I know that I know the world shouldn't be that way, but that's how you might get you might get the attention of somebody who. It is, it is in sports. <laughs> we've, yeah, we've talked about this. Yeah, it is. Thank you. So, hi, Catherine, and everybody. Um, just picking up on what you said about screening, um, while, while we were talking, discussing that Ireland-Wales rugby match earlier in the year, um, I, I randomly asked a couple of the Ireland players if they'd ever been screened. So this is, this, this is members of the Ireland senior squad, you know, guys okay. who are in their 20s. But now I'm wondering, is the position we'd like to reach really that if you are or are not colourblind, is neither here nor there because there, sh there shouldn't be any issues in terms of, as you say, bibs, cones, balls, kits. So you actually you wouldn't need to bother to find out if anybody was colourblind. I don't know. Yeah, but I think at the moment we do need to keep screening just to keep proving that this is the very, very first evidence that we've got. We need to keep proving that those players are there. Mm. So we've done it in football. We haven't done it in rugby yet. We know it's going to be the same pretty much. But we haven't done it in rugby yet. So in order to get rugby to buy in, maybe we do need to screen more players in rugby and more in football so that we keep reinforcing the point and eventually people who might be resisting at the moment will change. Yeah, and I think yeah. the difference in rugby is there's more players on the field, so more likelihood that there is a colorblind player on the field. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose conversely to that, I suppose the way rugby is played and the structure of it means players aren't scattered around the field quite so much, so there's maybe a little bit more opportunity for people to hide it but as I think we've all been saying it's it's putting players in a position where it doesn't matter if they're colorblind or not it's the it's the ideal situation yeah Hugh, Hugh the screening as well right now like I agree with you ultimately we'll get to a place where we shouldn't need it at all but I the importance of it right now is still it's still really there because it, even for myself with a club as progressive as as ours and who open you know open their arms to this kind of this research and doing this body of work I still have Will, will have had to have built a business case, you know, to go to our, you know, sort of CFO or whomever and say, look, this is the spend, this is what we'll need to commit to uh, now and, and ongoing. Um, so I think, and, and whilst it's modest and I don't think it, it's significant barrier, I, until it becomes so standard, that change, I think it, it, we need the evidence right now to build a case um, for, for everybody to, to, to topple the dominoes, really. Um, so I think, yeah, the screen is quite important for a little bit longer, would you? Agree? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, and obviously very respectfully to, to Swansea and that, that forward thinking approach, um, it's important to get the bigger organisations involved as well. Yeah. So we've got Francisca here from, from the Portuguese FA, so maybe she just wants to outline. Can I just come in on something that Daniel said um, in the chat? which might be a question for Francisca as well, is he said, is there any chance that UEFA can add this to club licensing regulations? Would that come under you in any way? Yes, from from uh, the Portuguese FA, we are now starting. We want to um, to screen all the all the national teams. I don't know if we will have the chance in the end to, to screen the national A team, but the other ones for sure. Um, regarding UEFA, we don't know. The, they are adding a lot of inclusion topics to the licensing, so probably they could add something like mm -hmm. this as well. Yeah, I think so. It's the, I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't. Yeah. It's just that, do they want to? I don't know the answer. We'll have to ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we will ask. Yeah. <laughs> and and just, uh, just a follow-up question. Um, it's Nick on the end, isn't it? I'm sorry, I don't know Nick's surname. Hello. Yeah, Big Nor, Nicholas Big Nor. Hi, hi. How you doing? Great. I mean, I, I'm a colourblind person, but not an elite sportsman, sadly. Um, that's my fault. Uh, Could you been? But I was colourblind at my uh, amateur level, uh, so I understand what you were saying. Um, is there? 
in players' minds, do, do you think there'd be a barrier to getting screened? Um, so those players I asked, they, they hadn't even thought of it, I must admit, but uh, from the players' point of view, would there be a reluctance to be screened, do you, do you think, or should there be should there be no reluctance then? In, in my head, in, in elite sports, probably, mm. only because it could lead you um, at a deficit or it could put you um, under someone else. If there's a lot of education and the players and the coaches and the staff are going to say that it's not a, it's not something that's going to affect you negatively. We just want to see what the numbers are and we can also make the changes to help you train so that it's more of a level playing field because in competitive sports you are going to get deselection but you want it to happen where you've, you've given your best and you don't have anything to say that I, I, I was struggling here and I didn't get any help. So I think as long as you educate the players as well and say that you're not going to get affected negatively, yeah. screening yeah. would be a good thing because you'd find people that are keeping quiet or maybe they didn't know or realise. Um, but it's just around you have you want to be careful in elite sports because any little any little smell of not being on the same level as everyone else is something that people run away from uh, straight away. So you'd have to be careful. Um, yeah, the, the, Adam just reminded me as well just to share with you um, when we did our screening. So it was all anonymous. The players were given the opportunity pre screening to disclose if so once the results were in if they wished that to be declared to the club they they could and if they didn't it remained anonymous and also we when the players went into the screening itself they weren't going in by name so like even the people screening them weren't aware of their identity and again it was their decision whether they wished to disclose that I absolutely agree with nick there was anxiety amongst some of the players around you know this and and it was no surprise to me because you know from the beyond the white line stuff i've I've heard many, many, many times players cite the fact they don't want clubs to know if they're struggling, whether it's with um, health or fitness or medical condition or mental health or anything really. So I think the anonymous nature of the screening was a, a really significant piece. Interestingly though, um, some of the players were open and receptive to it being disclosed. So they said right off the bat, yep, no problem. Others more reluctant. So yeah. we actually knew of one player yeah, because he was happy for the disclosure. And then there is another player that we know is colorblind, but we still to this day don't know their identity. Is there not also, I suppose, a, a benefit to the player outside of whatever sport they're playing, knowing mm -hmm. that they're colorblind? So it's a social yeah, Absolutely. topic as well as specific to the sports. So. And what a relief, by the way. Yeah. The relief in the players, uh, the, the two that I do know of that were happy, um, obviously not discounting the ones that weren't the relief because now we can communicate about it and we can talk about it in different contexts and actually they can be an advocate and an ally for others and there's loads of benefits. Um, I just wanted to ask that you, you got the medical teams on board, how hard was that to formulate? I'm not sure who's that that's going to. Probably this way. <laughs> Hi, yeah, Francis, Hello. I think. I didn't think of that, but the medical teams, how hard was it to you for you to get your medical teams on board with the screening? Oh, it's it it was not um, a big issue to we we meet them and we explain we we um, we we show them the studies that we have from Adam that the the numbers from from. The, in in general perspective, and then they said that it will be important for 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 us to um, to screen the players to see what is the prevalence in in our national team and our national teams. So we 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 started we are starting now. Probably in one month we will have some results. And then it will be easier for for the medical staff to implement uh, the big changes. And since we have a, a new player in the national team, they, he will have to to, to be screened for uh, for for color blind. So for each time you mean? Each yeah, time each time, each there. time. And then uh, we think at the same time we could. Push the, the the football clubs to do the same when they in in their clubs. So I think we will we will start and now I think it will be a 
a huge change in the future, I think so. Mm. It's interesting what we found about clubs that we know that screened previously um, before we started on this project. Um, well, and what we found from players who we screened as part of the project, um, we always ask them, have you been screened before and where have you been screened before? Um, and we're finding that less than 1% have been screened at their clubs. Um, there's one club that we know used to have a colourblind um, manager in the Premier League and they screen all the players. And we know of another club in the Premier League where they used to have a colourblind goalkeeper and they only screen the goalkeepers, <laughs> which <laughs> still makes me laugh. Um, so, uh, and we know of one European club that screens the players and that's it. Everyone else who had been screened before and that was just over 12% had been screened by the optometrist and one of them had a colorblind brother so that's why he was screened um so people are just not even thinking about it mm. so to get this buy-in will be fantastic you know if national squads are doing it yes mark yeah um in i mean again this might be something that's already obvious but is it, it strikes me it's almost part of a safeguarding issue for uh like players in in the in the academy isn't it because the the safeguarding officer has to look after the welfare of the players yeah so mark just i mark's going to answer that but yeah it that's where it sits for us at the moment actually now right for our head of safeguarding player care teams they they wrap around this massively so they were part of the screening process in the in pre-season but also from injury prevention and other uh, sports yeah so it's just from our perspective we we approach this from a player welfare perspective looking at it being a full contact sport and if players aren't certain about who's around and then there's obviously an increased risk to them um based on the the jerseys being worn but it, it's very much front and center from a player welfare perspective mm. for yeah. And it's almost like the the, the 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 players need to be told that that's that's part of what the safeguarding are doing, and you know, to be promoting it internally almost. Yeah, I agreed. Yeah, yeah. I, I think as well, without you know, when we talk about high performance elite sport, you know, it is a very small population that that we that we're talking about, but. Thinking about people at the lower levels as well. I know we've mentioned the academies a little bit in terms of financial loss, but the huge mental kind of health implications for those individuals that are dropped from academies at young ages. Um, they don't have the cognitive coping strategies in their when they're 9, 10, 13, 14, that maybe people later on in life do. Um, some of the, the research that we've done with, with individuals with CBD. One person spoke about the embarrassment of revealing it um, because people often say, well, what colour is this or what colour is that? Um, at the same time, um, there was also a player that he said he changed teams. So it was a footballer um, and he'd actually changed to a different local team. Now, if you've got a young individual who they're playing with their friends in their local team and they're struggling due to a variety of different factors, it's unlikely that they're going to want to or have that kind of cognitive ability to say, you know what, I'm going to move to a different team where there isn't a kick clash. That individual drops out of sport. The social benefits of being around their friends, the physical benefits of energy expenditure, thinking of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but also the, the kind of cognitive elements as well. We know that sport can be an excellent vehicle for promoting confidence engaging in that social interaction again if people are dropping out of sport at a young age that can have huge impact across the lifespan that's a good point good. so sorry mark's wife again if you don't mind can i just ask um when did testing and screening in schools stop because that's where it, it should come from <laughs> uh well it depends by country so in Germany, uh, everyone's screened in school at least once, so we understand. And there are there are player statistics for Germany um, on colour vision deficiency prevalence in elite sport. Um, in the UK, which is I know where you're based, um, it was completely removed from the school screening in 2009 based on faulty evidence. But that's something that we're fighting separately through Parliament to and, and contact with MPs to try and get that back into school screening. Um, so 
Uh, there's now a whole generation of children that have gone all the way through school and academies who are not being screened at school anymore. Um, and most countries are similar to the UK. Germany's of uh, a rare outlier in that regard. Yes, Mark. Um, so here is a question: Where do where do where do the panel think the best age group to aim to focus to to, to actually shift it? Is it in the like senior academies, the first team? Is it like right you know on the pre academies? Where's where's the where's the weeks where's the weeks weak spot to attack? Just me sitting here listening now, I'm thinking definitely academies based on what you said and what Mark's, um, what James has said. Um, I don't know. James has got better in, input on that than I have. I don't know if I'm, I'm yeah, going to give that on to Nick because like, I have a view, but I think it's uh, better firsthand. I would say as young as possible um, because literally you're, you're playing when you're seven, eight, nine. If you get screened at 12, and you've had those years of, of struggle. Um, so as soon as you can, just explaining that it's not something that's going to affect them negatively. It's just something that you want to see. You want to get a good scope of who's in the team. Um, but there's as young as possible, because that's when it starts, really. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Simone put, put a question in there. I can't see it. Are you typing, Simone? OK. Oh, oh, I have to leave. Really sorry, I have to. I have to jump off. I've got to collect from sports practice, but I, <laughs> I'm fully invested in this and would really Brilliant. like to continue working with you to help Thanks. push this. I'll be on the phone shortly. That's yeah. good. <laughs> well, after the pickup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not today. Yes. Speak very thank soon. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Two participants left the call. Jamie's typing something. Again, it was just a, a similar, I'm mindful you need to wrap up the date, so it was just to say uh, thank you very much. I look, I'll catch up with Mark but, uh, and Catherine. I look forward to supporting this uh, further. Thanks, Jamie. That was probably a good time to wrap up everybody, let you go and have your tea or whatever. Um, and thank, thanks all of you for staying on the line and uh, for your interest in this. We're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks all. Thank Take care. Luck. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.